When I was a, a kid, our church youth group took an outing to uh, Turkey Run State Park for a day of hiking, playing games, cooking out together. In the central meeting space in a large grassy meadow, there was someone put up a big 12 by 12 tent. In the middle of the afternoon, when there was some downtime, I wandered over to the tent to see what was happening inside. It turns out a group of older boys had commandeered the tent and made it their own. So when I pushed back the flap of the door of the tent, there was a a gatekeeper right there inside who said, wait. The ringleader from inside the tent said, who is it? Jeff Miner, the gatekeeper said, and that split second I knew I was being judged and I might be rejected. Oh, Jeff Miner, the ringleader said, he's cool, he can come in. (sighs) I was so relieved. More than you would think. I mean, it was just a stupid tent, right? But it was about more. Belonging. Being accepted. So I made my way into the tent and laid down in one of the corners and listened to the ongoing conversation. Before long, another kid came to the door of the tent. Wait, gatekeeper says. Who is it? Ringleader says. Ricky Jones. No, the ringleader said. He can't come in. My heart hurt for Ricky. I'd just been there. I could imagine easily what that felt like. I found myself thinking, maybe I shouldn't be in here. Maybe I should leave. But I didn't. It felt too good to be in. I didn't want to be out. One of our strongest felt human needs is belonging. The very first story in the Bible is about that. Genesis uh, Genesis 2, verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the Adam to be alone. Adam is the Hebrew word for human. It is not good for the human to be alone. Harvard professor and psychologist George Valiant puts it this way, we are wired to connect. Neuroscience has discovered that our brain's very design makes it sociable. Scientific studies show that the only thing that really matters in life when it comes to human happiness is your relationships with other people. The circle of people around us are like a cocoon that keeps us warm, the fabric of our belonging wrapping around us like a warm blanket. And whenever there is a tear in that fabric, we're exposed, we're cold, and we suffer. So let's talk about that today. This is the second installment in our sermon series, Managing Our Moods. At those times in life where there's a tear in the fabric of our belonging, when we feel isolated and alone as people of faith, as followers of Jesus, how should we respond? How can we respond in emotionally, spiritually healthy ways? Let's start with a prayer. God, You have created us to connect. But in this broken world, we often feel disconnected. Your word is relevant to every human problem. What's your wisdom on this one? When we're isolated and alone, how should we respond? Speak. Spirit of God, we ask In the name of Jesus, amen. So as we've already mentioned, this is Valentine's Day. Those among us who are single, if you're single and wish you weren't, 
Valentine's Day can be an especially poignant time as you remember, as you think, as you find yourself wondering, how long is it going to be, God, before lightning strikes and you bring that special someone into my life? That's exactly what John was feeling as he sat all alone at a table in a fancy restaurant on Valentine's Day. When he looked up from his menu, he noticed a beautiful redhead sitting at the table adjacent to him. He thought to himself, oh, I would love to meet her, but he just couldn't summon the courage. So he said instead a little prayer, God, help me make something happen here. And that's when it happened. Out of the blue, the beautiful redhead sneezed, a really hard sneeze, and her glass eye popped out. went flying through the air toward John reflexively, instinctively. He reached up and caught it. <laughs> Politely handed it back to her. Here, ma'am, I think this belongs to you. Oh my goodness, she says, I am so embarrassed as she popped her eye back into socket. How can I ever make it up to you, she asked. I know, she said, let me buy your meal. So she moved over to his table. They ordered their meals. They proceeded to have the most wonderful conversation. They laughed. They cried. She shared her deepest secrets. He shared his deepest secrets. After dessert, when it was time to say goodbye, she paid for the meal, gave him a kiss on the cheek and said, when can I see you again? He said, wow, are you always this nice to guys you meet? Oh, no, she said. Well, then he said, why me? Oh, I... I don't know, she said. I guess you could say you just <laughs> caught my eye. <laughs> For, a new low, eh? For those who are single and wish you weren't, Valentine's Day is a time that reminds us of that sense of loneliness. But you know, it's not just being single that challenges us and causes us to feel lonely. There are so many different factors in play. So many things in life that can tear the fabric of our belonging and cause us to feel lonely. You can end up feeling lonely even when you're married. Seasons and times come. Things change. In her book, The Year of Magical Thinking, noted author Joan Didion describes how she struggled in the first year after her husband died. She, in the book, marvels at the power of grief to, as she puts it, derange the mind. She says, in that first year after my husband died, I often found myself thinking like a little child, almost engaging, she says, in, in a kind of wishful thinking where, where in the back of my mind it sort of half seemed like maybe this wasn't real. Maybe the story could be changed and, and the outcome altered. Several months into this experience, she said, I finally summoned the energy to begin sorting through his clothes, putting them in separate stacks to donate to thrift shops. But she says, when I got to his shoes, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't give his shoes away. She says, I sat down and thought to myself, why? And then she said, it hit me. That in the back of my mind, I was half thinking, if he should come back, he'll need his shoes. There's probably no pain greater than the loss of a loved one. And we feel so alone. For some of us, it's the loss of a loved one. For some of us, it may be being single. For others of us, the loneliness we carry may go all the way back to some of our formative experiences in life. 
In Larry Crabb's book, Connecting, he tells the story of a friend of his who grew up in a dysfunctional family. His friend told him the worst times was dinner time. We'd, we'd sit around the table and, and there'd either be no conversation at all or loud quarreling. His friend told him there was this happy family that lived down the street from us in, a, in an old-fashioned farmhouse with a big porch on the front of their house. Larry's friend told him, when, when I was 10 years old, I began excusing myself from the dinner table as soon as I could. I would sneak out of the house and make my way down the street to that old farmhouse. His friend told him, I would literally crawl under that front porch and sit close to the house and lean my ear against the wall to hear that family at their dinner table and the laughter and the stories they would share and the love that was there. And I thought to myself, if only I could belong to a family like this. For some of us, the loneliness we carry may go all the way back to our formative experiences and our longing for belonging may be something that we've experienced for a long, long time because God knows there are so many things that can tear at the fabric of our belonging. The truth is every single one of us is going to experience seasons of loneliness in our life. The things that tear the fabric of our belonging include conflict, abuse, death, divorce, illness, a geographic move, aging, Self-destructive behavior. There are so many conditions, so many circumstances that can usher in those seasons of loneliness. So when that happens, as people of faith, as followers of Jesus, how should we respond? This morning, I want to share with us two key lessons that we can draw from the scriptures. One from the life and experience of Jesus, the other from the life and the experience of King David. First, Jesus. Probably most of us imagine that Jesus' family must have been ideal. But the third chapter of the Gospel of Mark tells us a story that challenges that assumption. I'm sure Jesus had a good family, but even good families struggle sometimes. And Mark chapter 3 tells us about a time when Jesus' relationship with his family was severely strained. This wasn't long after Jesus had begun his public ministry. The things he was doing were creating quite an uproar, not always in a positive way. Jesus was working miracles. Great. Jesus was healing the sick. Wonderful. Jesus was preaching and teaching great things. Jesus was also telling people, your sins are forgiven. Wait, who is this guy who presumes to forgive sins? Religious leaders, religious authorities in Jesus' culture began to get their backs up and, and they decided they needed to deal with this Jesus and needed to deal with him now. And so Mark chapter 3 verse 22 tells us that the scribes, a group of scribes from Jerusalem came down to Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, and, and warned the people of Jesus' hometown that, quote, Jesus has Beelzebul. That was, Beelzebul was regarded as the prince of demons back then in that culture. Jesus has Beelzebul, these scribes said, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. In other words, what he's doing is of the devil. Can you imagine people saying that about Jesus? At the time when Jesus most needed his family, they weren't there for him. We're told in Mark's gospel, when his family heard it, what the scribes, the religious leaders were saying about Jesus, they went out to restrain him. 
for people, not just the religious authorities now, but people in general were saying about Jesus, he has gone out of his mind. At the time when Jesus most needed his family to stand with him, to be proud of him, to support him, they were buying into the negative scuttlebutt about him and went out to restrain him. I'm sure Jesus must have thought, Mom, even you? After all of the prophecies that you heard at my birth, how could you not understand that I'm just doing what I'm born to do? But according to Mark, even Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. We know later she came around. But in this particular season, for some reason, she didn't get it. Come home. You're embarrassing yourself. People are saying you're going out of your mind and that you've got a demon. You just need to rest for a while. I'm sure this really hurt Jesus. We're told in verse 31, then his mother and his brothers came and standing outside the house where he was teaching, they didn't even come inside. They sent a message in, come out. We need a private word with you. They sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around Jesus. And the crowd said to him, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. I picture Jesus as he pauses in his teaching. I picture him maybe looking down at his feet, gathering his thoughts, processing his feelings. Your family's here to get you. And then almost as if he's thinking aloud. We're told Jesus replied, who are my mother and my brothers? Who really is your family? And looking at those who sat around him, Jesus said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Do you see the wisdom that's in that for you and me? At a time in Jesus' life when his family wouldn't or couldn't be there for him, at least for a season, Jesus knew that he would need that circle of belonging. And so Jesus intentionally calls round him what we today would call his family of choice. For him, that was spiritual community, his disciples. Jesus didn't isolate. Jesus didn't indulge in self-pity. He began to deliberately and intentionally cobble together his family of choice for this season in life, surrounding himself with people who wanted to be there. And there is a great lesson in that for you and me in our own times of loneliness and struggle. If we are feeling lonely today, what are we doing to put ourselves out there and to be proactive about gathering around us our circle of belonging, the fabric of our belonging. I love the way Proverbs 18.24 reads in the King James Version. It says, those who have friends must themselves be friendly. It's kind of obvious, isn't it, when you think about it? But if I want to have friends around me, I've got to put myself out there and be friendly. I can't be sitting at home sulking. I can't be sitting at that table in the restaurant waiting for the beautiful gal at the next table to pop an eyeball that happens to land in my hand. I can't be sitting in the pew at church just waiting for my next best friend to suddenly discover me. Like Jesus, I've got to intentionally and consciously take steps to assemble the fabric of my belonging. Most of us are familiar with the biblical principle of sowing and reaping. And never 
Is that principle truer than when it comes to the fabric of our belonging? We, generally speaking, over the course of time, tend to reap what we sow. By the way, I, uh, I heard a really good pun the other day that I've just got to share with you. So consider this a, a, a bad joke alert, all right? <laughs> Those of you who are participating at home, if you have a weak stomach for bad jokes, you may want to turn the volume down and clear small children from the room so that they don't have nightmares. Not because this is a scary joke or anything wrong about it, it's just really corny, all right? So you've been warned, right? There's this meme that's going around these days. Maybe you've seen it. It goes like this. My friend composes songs about sewing machines. I guess you could say she's a singer-songwriter. Or so it seems. <laughs> Isn't that good? It's so bad, it's good, right? <laughs> when it comes to sowing and reaping, S-O-W-I-N. When it comes to sowing and reaping, we always draw from that biblical principle the most obvious point that if you want to reap, you've got to sow. Okay, fair enough. But there is another point just as important, if not more so. If you want to keep reaping, you've got to keep sowing. So in the spring, you plant corn so that in the fall, you can harvest that corn. But then the calendar turns and it's spring again. You don't say, oh, I sowed corn last year. I don't need to do it again. I'll have another harvest this fall. And fall comes and you have no harvest. Life is filled with seasons. We don't sow in one season and then think it's over for the rest of time. We have to keep sowing on a regular basis. And never is that truer than when it comes to the fabric of our belonging in life. Sometimes, I, I, I've watched this happen over the years, over the course of my what is it, 23 years here at Life Journey now. Over the course of time, I've I've been here long enough to see people that have been part of this church for decades. And, and I've noticed that it's not uncommon that, that people who were once deeply rooted and grounded socially in this congregation, who had a, a real circle of, they were really integrated into the circle of our church family. But over the course of time, some of those people that were closest friends with them, maybe Maybe this couple moves to another state. And maybe this other couple experiences a divorce. And maybe this other couple has some kind of illness that discombobulates their life. And, and this person who's been integrated in the church for, for years and years looks around themselves and suddenly realizes that the fabric of my belonging has been ripped apart. And sometimes I watch as people drift away because of that. I don't feel like I belong like I used to. But I've watched other people go through that same phenomenon, realize that their fabric of belonging had been torn, and then proceed to be very intentional about sowing for a new harvest. So they get reinvolved in an oasis group, or they take a few discipleship classes or they get involved in a ministry team. And before long, their sowing leads to a harvest and the fabric of their belonging is repaired. A circle of people around them for a new time and a new season in their life. That principle applies not just in church community, but in most any venue of life, in our workplace, in our circle of friends outside of church in our extended families sowing and reaping in season out of season those who wish to have friends must themselves be friendly 
For me personally, the fabric of my belonging was most torn years ago when I was a young adult just beginning the coming out process. That was the scariest thing I've ever done. And back in the day when I was coming out, back in the 80s, when you came out, as is sometimes still true today, you, you were risking losing everything. And I lost a lot. I lost my church home. I lost all my church friends. And I was beginning to distance myself from my own family for fear that they would figure it out and that they might reject me. But I knew that I, I needed a community around me. I needed that fabric of belonging. And I knew that for me, as in the case of Jesus, it needed to be spiritual community. I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, and so I looked around and I found an LGBTQ Christian fellowship group. And I started getting involved with that group. As, as Christmas time was rolling around that year, I found myself thinking, what am I going to do for Christmas this year? All my friends that I, I was close to at my old church, they're gone now. And, and I was distancing myself from my family, plus they live thousands of miles away. I found myself wondering, what am I going to do? That's when somebody in the Christian Fellowship Group reached out and invited several of us, about 10 of us, to his town home for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We'll have a, an old-fashioned Christmas together like we're a family, he said. So I arrived on Christmas Eve. We sat around the Christmas tree in his living room, and, and the 10 of us read the biblical Christmas story and talked about that a little bit. And then we sang Christmas carols. And then we, we prayed together. It was beautiful. As it got late, we'd all brought our sleeping bags, so we unrolled sleeping bags here and there throughout his town home. In the room where I ended up, I rolled out my sleeping bag, and this guy on the other side of the room rolled out his sleeping bag. We didn't know each other very well yet, but before we drifted off to sleep, he said, so what's your family doing tonight? What are your family Christmas traditions? And I, I told him. And then I asked about his family and what they'd be doing. Bruce and I would go on to become really good friends. The next morning after breakfast, all 10 of us in this cramped little kitchen began making a Christmas feast together. Nothing like cooking together to build a sense of community. We had the most fabulous Christmas feast. Afterwards, gathered around the Christmas tree again, there was a gift exchange. And then till late at night, we talked, we laughed, we told stories, we commiserated. And at some point that evening, I looked around and I thought to myself, here are my mothers, my brothers, and my sisters. At least for that season in time, when my family couldn't or I wouldn't let them understand me and when other friends had departed from me, at least for that season of time, this became my family of choice. We were a shelter in the storm for one another. I don't know what I would have done without them. And we made beautiful memories together. Here then, is the first of two key lessons we can learn from the scriptures for when I feel isolated and alone. As a person of faith, how do I respond? Lesson number one, like Jesus, be intentional about cobbling together around you your new family of choice. Be intentional, be proactive. Don't isolate. Yes, Mourn and grieve those you have lost. Process your feelings, but don't get stuck there. Like Jesus, build your family of choice. There is, though, a second key scriptural principle that's relevant to what we're talking about, and that's the second one comes from the life of King David before he became a king. You probably know the backstory, right? How David, as a teenager, summoned the courage to 
confront the giant Goliath and with his shepherd's sling alone, he managed to prevail over him. So David suddenly becomes this national hero in Israel and people start saying, maybe someday he's going to be our king. That was not music to the ears of the then king of Israel, King Saul. King Saul began to see David as an upstart rival to the throne or a rival to Saul's son's ascension to the throne. And so Saul grew more and more suspicious about David until that suspicion hardened into anger and Saul hatched a plot to have David assassinated. When word of that leaked out, David had to flee for his life into the wilderness of Judea. And he ended up living for a period of time in a cave in the wilderness. The scripture passage that you heard John read earlier in this service, Psalm 142, David wrote that prayer from that cave. Talk about, being, talk about the fabric of your belonging being ripped apart. David's family were far away from him. All David's dear friends, not there. Here he was in a cave, wondering if he would live or he would die. That's when he wrote these words. Verse 3, Psalm 142. In the path where I walk, they've hidden a trap for me. Look on my right hand and see. In those times, your friends, your honored friends would stand traditionally at formal ceremonies on your right hand. Look on my right hand, David said, and see. There's no one who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for me. The fabric of his belonging was ripped to shreds. Have you ever found yourself at a place in life when it seemed like, Everybody had departed from you. You were all alone. Or maybe you're surrounded by people, people who love you. But you find yourself going through something that no matter how hard they try, they can't really understand. Because you're the one with cancer. You're the one going through a bitter divorce. You're the one whose child is suicidal. And you feel so alone. What do you do? Do what David did. Verse 5. David says, I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge. Remember, he's just said, no refuge remains to me. The people around him stripped away. But now he says, wait a minute. You, God, are my refuge. You are my portion in the land of the living. In other words, God, you are my ultimate friend. When nobody else around me can or will listen and fully understand what I'm going through, you are there for me. Therefore, he goes on to say, verse 2, I pour out my complaint before God. I tell my trouble to God. When my spirit is faint, you, oh God, know my way. To put it simply, David realized, I can tell God anything. And as you read through his prayers in the Psalms, you see him doing just that. He doesn't hold back. He puts it out there. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And in the process, God ends up becoming David's best friend. Do you have that kind of relationship with God? Or I should say, are you cultivating that kind of of relationship with God. I grew up here in Indiana, Acton, Indiana. Ever heard of it? It's down in Franklin Township, a little hole in the wall town. From first grade into high school, I ran in the same circle of friends. I played basketball with the same group of guys all of those years. I belonged. I was somebody. 
But then in the middle of high school, my family up and moved to Colorado Springs. I ended up in a high school four times the size of Franklin Central. I knew no one. I was painfully shy. I was a classic nerd. I was short and skinny. And in that big high school that had lots of talent, they didn't want me on their basketball team. Now I was the one on the outside of the tent. I felt so isolated. I felt so alone. So what did I do? I did what David did. Several times a week, I would load my dog, Yezibo, into our family Volkswagen Beetle, and I would drive 10 minutes to a wilderness preserve called Austin Bluffs in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, and I would make my way up to the top of this cliff. I would make my way up to the very tippy top of that cliff, and I would sit down, and from the top there, you can see the entire city of Colorado Springs. Beyond that, Pikes Peak, as far to the north and the south as you can see, the front range of the Rocky Mountains. Many an evening, I would sit up there with my dog and watch the sun set over the front range of the Rocky Mountains as the lights came on in the city below. Colorado, Rocky Mountain High. I've seen it raining fire in the sky as the sun set over the Rocky Mountains. And there on my perch, me and my dog, I would pour out my heart to God. I would tell God my hopes and my fears, my anxieties and my dreams. And I would listen in my heart for what God might be saying back to me. And God became my best friend, my best friend forever. I hope for you in your life that at some point you will experience a season of enough loneliness that you will discover God as your best friend, your BFF. This is the other key lesson that we can learn from the scriptures today about those seasons of loneliness in our life. When you feel isolated, alone, like David, make God your best friend. Focus on that and you'll be amazed at how much companionship that brings into your life. The truth is, unfortunately, Seasons come and go in our life, and therefore, our circles of belonging, people around us, come and go as we move through the seasons of our life. Even your best friend can be separated from you by death or something like that, and, and you may someday come to your end, and your family and friends may already be gone. And there may be no familiar faces around you. But you will not be alone if you've, get, if you've made friends with God. That's what David discovered. That's what he writes about in Psalm 139. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, <laughs> ever done that? You are there. If I take the wings of the morning and fly to the farthest limits of the sea, where there's nobody around me, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. And the most poignant words of all, I come to the end, and I'm still with you. You're still there. God wants to be friends with you. God wants to be there for you. But Jeff, I don't know how to be friends with God. Do what David did. Talk to God like you would talk to a friend. Stop being so self-conscious. Stop feeling so unworthy. God wants to hear from you. Share your heart with God. God, wow, did I ever have a day God, I don't want to ask you for anything right now. I just want to tell you about my day 
if that's okay. Wow, it was such a busy day, God, and yet I got so much done, and I feel really good about that. But God, today something happened that I've been expecting to happen for a long, long time. The shoe dropped today, God. I just want to process that in your presence, if it's okay. And then you tell God all about it. And then you stop and say, God, what do you think about it? Do you have any guidance for me? And you listen in your heart. And if you sense something in your heart, just like you've been talking aloud to God, you say aloud what you sense God saying back to you. And if that resonates with your soul, that's your word for the day from God. Thank you, God. But don't just think about yourself. God, how was your day? I wonder if you ever feel lonely. Maybe that's why you live in Trinity, your own fabric of belonging. Thank you, God, for letting me be part of your fabric of belonging. I love you, and I am so glad you love me. That's how you talk to God. You just share your heart, the good, the bad, <laughs> the ugly, and before long you will discover that God is your BFF and that you are never alone. Even when you get to the end of your time, when maybe family and friends, they're gone, and no familiar faces are around you, you will never be alone if you've made God your best friend. I come to the end and you are still with me. Make God your best friend and you will never be alone. Amen.